Okay, a little less than 10 minutes to go. Um, let's see, what I want to do right now, this has, a, this has a little bit to do with the presentation, but it uh, are some slides from the last presentation. Oh, good. Okay, that's what I want to know. Thanks, Max. I heard someone else was checking that earlier, and um, Shiloh gave me a, a, a check, and it works on coffee refresh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me let me go to a um, last time. Okay, this doesn't have to do with this one. Well, it does. Okay, but this was the presentation I gave last time, and or or if not last time, sometime before, but. It was about particle physics. Well, what does that have to do with what we're doing today? Well, for one, we're talking about forces. I, when I was talking about particle force, excuse me, particle physics, we're talking about different forces than we are today. So planets and larger, in other words, when you have a lot of matter, then gravity is the predominant force. You can still have, and we'll, we'll note, you can still have electromagnetic forces because the Earth, for example, has a magnetic field and uh, most of the sun, planets, moon, not moons, but others have uh, electric, uh, electromagnetic fields. So, but gravity and electromagnetism are the ones which are predominant um, when you're talking about large. When I was talking about particle physics, um, electromagnetism was still there, but gravity played no part, and we simply had basically the strong and uh, weak force. Um, so, the last here again, I haven't started on um, the uh, this presentation, but I'm trying to tie these in a little bit. I was talking about the standard model model of particle physics. And these are all the little species, as they call them. Actually, that's the proper term uh, for particles we found. But there's only a few of these that really hang around for any length of time. Um, others may hang around for a, a, a millionth or a, a billionth of a second. Um, and we know that they're there, and we know how they're related and such. But um, the ones which actually if you think about it, uh, the universe has been around for a long time and things have kind of chilled out. In other words, out in space there, if you measured the temperature out in space, it's about three degrees Kelvin. Um, it must, it was much hotter earlier and you used to, and the universe used to be populated with some of this stuff. But right now you basically have this. Um, yeah. Charmed and strange quarks are different quarks. Yes. And actually, if you look down there on the bottom right, here again, I got, I'll start my, can't be chart, yeah. In other words, it can't be both. But if you look down on the bottom right, what you see is a relative mass of the quarks. And the U and the D are, are up and down quarks. And those are the ones which are around. By the way, if you came in, you're confused because you wanted to go see the one on Earth and solar system, <laughs> it's okay. I haven't started yet. I'll start that one in five minutes. I'm just tying in what I mentioned last time or the last presentation to this one. But in the bottom right, there you see the different kinds of quarks and what you have, the different sizes represent the different weights um, and the amount of energy basically that you need to find them. And so the up and down, the little U and D are the ones that we are actual in normal matter um, that that we have. So on the right, on the left, up on the top there, yeah, uh, one up equals two downs. Not really. They actually can change back and forth due to what's called chromodynamics or color in in the in the strong force. Yeah, I know. Boy, <laughs> it gets pretty weird. But I thought I'd show you this. I got four minutes here, and I'll start the presentation in four minutes. But if you look up in the upper left. You've got the proton, which actually has two ups and a down. <laughs> and then you've got the neutron, which has uh, an up and two downs. 
And they actually, like I said, they can they can change back and forth um, inside the um, proton or the neutron. Now here again, the protons and neutrons are inside a nucleus. So you're looking at really, really, really small um, area, but there are other quarks and electrons don't have any, that's right. If you look at the little gray thing down there where it says electron, that's the approximate weight of an electron compared to the other ones. But you've got bottom and top and strange and charm and up and down. And, <laughs> um, and the electron can't be divided anymore. It's, it's an elementary particle, the same way as the quarks are. Now, the reason why this is important is because if you look to the left on the bottom, Yeah, I know, <laughs> but that's what I'm trying to unconfuse it a little bit, is that on the bottom left, the forces used to all be united also, but in a gazillionth of a second, and you actually have it down there, the, the amount of energy present and basically how hot it was and then the uh, how long it was since the Big Bang, you had a breakout of the forces. They essentially froze out. Think of phases where if it's really, really hot, you've got plasma, and then as you get further, plasma meaning the atoms themselves, uh, the electrons are off of them, and then as you get a gas, you've got um, atoms that are bouncing around, but they're bouncing around too much to um, be together, and then as they get cooler, they turn into a liquid, and then the liquids turn into a solid when they get uh, uh, closer together, and there's some, uh, all that stuff like that. Well, essentially the forces were like that. Okay, I have two minutes before I do the actual presentation. So if you've come to the presentation on the Earth and solar system, it's here. This is it. I'm just explaining last time. By the way, I was uh, recommending that you um, go to midnight, okay, for this presentation. And then, so here's a little bit more of what, what actually was around during the early part of the, um, hello, uh, during the early part of the, but then I can't see your face. I know, for some reason, my face is, I don't know, I haven't looked there, but for some reason, so don't look at the face, look at the slides. <laughs> I don't know why. Oh, it's too dark. Oh, that's true. Okay, I thought I had it kind of lit up, but that's fine. Uh, so any case, this is an interesting slide. I've got one minute to the regular presentation, but this is kind of interesting because all of the elements, except at the very beginning of the Big Bang, were formed in stars. Okay, so hydrogen and helium, you, uh, you've got, uh, were around fairly early, but if you look at this one, all of these were formed. In other words, it shows hydrogen and helium. Up, okay, it's now time to start the new one, so I'm going to go to that one, but uh, right after here, but if you look up at the top there, you'll see on the far upper left, far upper right, that hydrogen helium started during the Big Bang. But it, but cosmic rays and small stars and supernovae and all that stuff like that, everything that we know there. Um, oh, really? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to go back to uh, start this presentation, but I thought I'd show you that the one I gave last time was related to um, this one. So we're here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I see we've got a, a great audience, some new people, I think, as well as some people who have um, we've known forever almost. And as I was saying, this is going to be a presentation on the Earth and the solar system, and it's not a, it's much more exciting than it sounds. <laughs> so I'd like to also thank Jess for some ambiance there with the little solar system over to my right or your left, and to the uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis and some astronauts floating around watching us uh, that are very much not alive. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look then at our presentation today. I think you'll find it uh, rather interesting. Okay, when, when I studied um, uh, the Earth and the solar system a long time ago, you know, it, was, it does, did seem kind of like, okay, there's this big sun, 
and there's these little planets and everything else is space. And oh yeah, there's some asteroids. And that was about it. And I thought that was interesting because we're on one of the little third rocks from the sun. But uh, yeah, dust and gas and stuff. But I didn't know about the dust and gas till later. But I'm going to show you much more. Unless you've kept up with this topic, I think you'll be rather amazed as to just the solar system itself, what's going on. Okay, so the first thing is like, why? Okay, uh, that, what I'm going to be talking about is stuff that's not on Earth. It's probably not part of your life or the life of most people. Uh, why do we spend billions to go out and check it out? Uh, what, what does it have to do with now and me and you and anything? Uh, but on the other hand, if you're a good scientist, perhaps um, George Mallory, who was last seen, by the way, if you don't know uh, uh, George Mallory, um, uh, Mount Everest was officially climbed in 1953, at least from um, evidence. But George Mallory may have been the first person to climb Mount Everest back in 1924. He was last seen only about 800. He and his partner were last seen only 800 feet from the top. His body was found um, in around 1990 something, I think. Um, yeah, because they're there. <laughs> Okay, so, but let's take a look. So in other words, the first thing I want to start out with is when we talk about uh, out there, the solar system and, and, and beyond, it's kind of a psychological thing, not just a physiological or physical thing, is that exploring other worlds sparks our imaginations from Marco Polo represented over on the left. And of course, long before that too, uh, works of fiction, um, like Lord of the Rings or Star Trek Discovery or, but hopefully you get the same feeling when you see the little Perseverance rover or other ones on uh, Mars right now. The same sense of, even if I can't go there, uh, I can be excited from other people's. Because we, yeah, well, Syzygy, now you, you've hit on a point there. In other words, why? And that's why I'm saying this is kind of a psychological thing, too. Is it uh, resources to exploit? Uh, or is it something to, well, no, you're on, yeah, but half kidding is, is also half not kidding, and you're correct. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Colonize, all that stuff. So, if you look at this, it kind of reveals us and our place. Depending on what country you're in and other things, you might look at the one on the left. You know, if you're in the U.S. or not, uh, and you might have a certain feeling about that. But what about the one in the in the middle? You know, the uh, we're an international audience. Uh, China is marching forward, and they um, are planning uh, a uh, first a space station around the moon, and then moon bases, and then to be on Mars. And it's very possible the first person on Mars will be a Chinese woman, uh, depending on how things go. Um, and then we have to also think about, well, when we get out there, is it going to be uh, Star Wars or is it going to be Star Trek? Is it going to be a competition or is it, well, UAE, hang on a second, because UA, or UAE, because UAE has a orbiter uh, called HOPE. Uh, orbiting Mars uh, right now, and I'll get and I'll get to that. But absolutely, in other words, who knows? Uh, so, but we have to kind of think: Is it going to be Star Wars competition, um, first come first serve, grab what you can, or is it going to be Star Trek, a uh, alliance of uh, people out uh, exploring and not messing with? Uh, what we find out there as far as first contact and stuff, if you know the uh, prime directive, United Federation of Planets. Well, we can't even find a United Federation of Nations yet, so that's, that'll be interesting. Okay, and then if we do find life, are we going to um, look at it like, you know, E.T., if you've seen the movie, it's uh, another species, exciting, we can learn from them, or are we expecting that everything will just eat us or subjugate us, <laughs> you know. Uh, 
certainly our history has been poor in that respect. In other words, when we found America, um, part of it, we didn't even know that we killed off most of the people due to just uh, bugs, um, diseases which they'd never seen. And then the other part was uh, not too pretty either, generally. Um, but um, you don't have to, okay, you don't have to betray your age out there, but I remember, does anyone remember the picture up in the upper right? Yes, we are stuck with our primate ancestry. And I'm finding the older I get, the more you study animal psychology and animal behavior, you understand um, uh, people better. Picture of, up in the upper right is a picture of the moon and that little part of it, Earthrise over the moon. Anybody actually remembers that? I remember it well. This is Apollo 8 in December of um, 1968. And the big blue marble. Yeah, the blue marble. Exactly. Okay. And this was outstanding because all of a sudden, as they rounded this sterile-looking moon, you had this bright blue dot rise over the moon. And it gave everybody, just like the first view of the Earth, it gave everybody kind of a, a pause at what they were looking at. Um, and going, oh my goodness, everything I've ever known, everybody, our whole world is on that tiny little orb. And that was a, a very uh, spaceship Earth, absolutely. It was a very powerful moment. And it actually, by the way, that picture and the moment itself gave rise to uh, Earth Day, uh, to um, environmental um, awareness, uh, other things. I mean, not, not it it's alone, or whole Earth catalog. Yep, I've still got those <laughs> somewhere locked away. Okay, but if you want to get practical about all of this, is space exploration has also given us new science. Yeah, there is no planet B. There's no plan B. There's no planet B. I've never heard of it. That's cool. I've never heard of this planet B, like plan B. That's cool. There's no planet B right now. But there better be, because I'll tell you about it here in a minute. Okay, so it also has created new science and technology. Everything you see there has come out of the space program. LASIK surgery, the little remote thermometers, which you may have uh, experienced this during the pandemic, uh, computers in, in, in many ways. Uh, Plan 9, <laughs> yeah, um, if anybody remembers that movie, lots of hokey movies. I'll get to that too. Artificial limbs, uh, space blankets, rumble strips, firefighting equipment, uh, aircraft um, de-icing, solar pa uh, panels, uh, the Speedo, uh, swimsuit, frozen food. I mean, not swimsuits necessarily, but the Speedo one in particular, uh, how, yeah, everything. I mean, it's hard. I, I have one slide here. <laughs> well, actually not tame, believe it or not. I looked some of this up, not Velcro, not Tang, but some of the other, but because Tang had actually been around. Yeah, I did too. I thought it was also. Uh, but I had I looked some of this up to make sure I, before I show you stuff, I like to look it up to make sure <laughs> that I'm correct. Now, the European Union uh, or ESO, American Sp uh, European Space um, Organization, such ha or agency, has its own missions, but this is the one I saw from NASA, and essentially, you know, we're driven to ESA. We're driven to explore the unknown, uh, to challenge our boundaries. And in return, we have benefits for society. We address fundamental questions about ourselves and where we are, expand technologies, new industries. And it's basically curiosity and exploration are vital to the human soul. To boldly go where no one has gone before <laughs> the the first Star Trek and then uh, Star Trek Next Generation. Yeah, no one. <laughs> okay. Um, but the next kind of leap there is getting there. If you, yeah, exactly. Star Trek Next Generation, uh, 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 fix that one. 
Okay, so how do you actually get there? Now we get to the physical part. Is not just the psychological part, but the physical part. Is um, if you hitchhike, like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I mean, that's what that was written for, right? Okay, 42, I think. <laughs> Is it 42 or 42? Um, okay, so um, if you shoot, think about it. If you shoot a high-powered rifle into the air, um, and hopefully you stand out of the way, it's not straight up because people are killed by bullets coming down because bullets come down at 150 miles an hour. You shoot a bullet straight into the air, about how far up does it go? Anybody know? High-powered rifle. Okay, it only goes about 10,000 feet. Uh, so to get off the earth, um, you need to be going a lot faster than a bullet. Well, I was mentioning high-powered rifle, which I think it's 1,500 meters per second or something. Um, I don't, yeah, it depends on the rifle, but I, but I looked it up, and it goes about 10,000 feet into the air and then comes down at 150 miles an hour, and hopefully you're not underneath it. Uh, exactly. Okay, so um, getting there also has the kind of the psychological thing, is that uh, at the very beginning, we thought of the heavens as um, the heavens. In other words, uh, they were static. They weren't a realm to mess with. They were perfect circles, perfect orbs, uh, portends, anything that actually changed up there, um, you could. Uh, anything that actually changed was something that was alarming. Uh, if you had a comet, if you had a meteor, if you had any of that kind of stuff like that. Um, and then when Galileo and others um, got a telescope, they basically said, oh, now wait a second, it's not perfect. <laughs> uh, the moon has mountains, the um, sun has spots, the Jupiter has moons, Saturn has rings. They're other worlds, they're imperfect. Maybe we want to know more about them. Maybe we can visit them one day. So people were thinking about that. Instead of just the realms of the gods, they were thinking that, oh my. Uh, yeah, Google Map already has it. Um, okay. There are also the stuff of imagination. From early times, Jules Verne's there was um, platonic shapes, exactly. Perfect spheres, perfect orbits, all of that. Um, epicycles, whatever you needed to do to make them not, to make them perfect. But, you know, uh, whether books or movies or whatever, you've got um, Imagination runs wild about what these other worlds might look like or be like. So actually getting off the ground, we first had to get off the ground. And that came from Tonic Shape Tradition. Um, so the first thing was blues, end of the 1700s. Uh, the uh, Montgolfier brothers in, in Paris, they're up on the upper left. Um, of course, they just like everything else, they were turned into a war, war uh, tool, like on the bottom left in the Civil War. Um, but the balloons are still used uh, for atmospheric research. Um, but of course, as, as in the upper right, um, but then that's just the atmosphere. By the way, the atmosphere I learned, I was looking it up, is the atmosphere is, is basically defined as, in other words, the where is space and where is the atmosphere as 100 kilometers up, or about 62 miles. And that, that's considered the uh, edge of space. Um, well, actually, yes, uh, Baragon, Venus, and the uh, moon Titan, although that wasn't a balloon, but you're right, uh, Venus, took about two hours to get to the surface, um, and it survived. Uh, now, but the first actual craft into space, in other words, to get beyond the atmosphere, was a V-2 rocket in 1944 that actually got up into space. Of course, it came down. Um, because it wasn't going fast enough. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily at the right angle, but um, two hours to get to the edge of the surface. No, two hours for the balloon to descend through the clouds of Venus to get to the surface of Venus. Uh, I may not have said that correctly. The same thing on the on, on Titan. It took about an hour or something like that to get down to the, uh, in a parachute. 
uh, down to uh, the uh, surface of Titan. Okay, so what are the issues in space? Here again, you want to see the pictures of all this good, of all these places, but um, first of all, we need to kind of study the um, what we what is involved in getting there. Well, there's a lot of challenge. Um, <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay, there's a lot of challenge with with uh, space exploration. One is getting off the Earth, as I mentioned, and getting back. Okay, uh, remember that you're up there now. You're going seventeen thousand five hundred miles if you're in orbit. How do you then slow down and get back to Earth safely without burning up? That was that's a big issue. Uh, it's not one to be taken lightly. If you've ever seen the movie Gravity, it's it's rather fascinating. Uh, there's there's some issues with that movie, uh, but it's a very fascinating movie. Um, there's also distances. Now, if you want to imagine, it, you could see the little solar system. Uh, yes, sp space-wise. Uh, I lived in Japan for three years, and it's rather fascinating how the Japanese people deal with space and personal space and, and in some cases having none and that kind of stuff. So if you look at the little solar system model over to uh, your left, my right, um, you will see the planets rotating around there. By the way, that's not to scale at capsule hotels, absolutely, uh, in Tokyo and stuff, uh, and I'm certain other places. Um, yeah, okay, so in any case, uh, those are not to scale, and they're not, they representative, but they're not necessarily to scale or distance-wise. So how do you imagine the solar system? If I were to create the solar system here in the second, uh, excuse me, in sine circle region, if you remember the, um, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the region that had it, um, that had a model like this. But essentially, if the sun is about the size of a person, in this case, let's say a, 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 a smaller person, 1.4 meters in diameter. Um, if everything was shrunk a billion times, that's the size of the sun, the Earth would be a grape 150 meters away. In other words, we actually could do that here on the island. Uh, with a pea-sized moon that's only 15 inches or 0.4 meters away from it, Jupiter would be a large grapefruit 750 meters away. Now, bear in mind that one of the regions in Second Life is only 250 meters, so it's like three other sims away. And then you can read the other one. Saturn is an orange, and Neptune's four and a half kilometers away. So the planets are a long way away. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and hang on a second. I need to go back and explain. Also, Space is hostile uh, to life and machines. Right now, that little helicopter on Mars, even it's on Mars, and yet it's still having to survive the uh, nighttime temperatures, which can easily fall into uh, minus 100 something. In space, essentially, if you were right there in this picture, you, on the sun side, it would be uh, plus 250 on, the, on your... The back side of you would be minus 250. And of course, there's no air. <laughs> there's there's nothing. Humans require a lot of care. We, we, we need, uh, it doesn't matter in this case, <laughs> uh, because it's uh, it's hot and it's cold. Okay, I was trying to think, you know, which one. I think it's probably Fahrenheit, but it really doesn't matter in this case. Okay, so uh, yeah, we need water. We need pressure. We need oxygen. We need a lot of stuff that uh, we don't have in space unless we carry it with us. And it's uh, a lot of coffee. We need coffee. Yes. OK. Uh, let's take a look then at voyages and discoveries. This is the uh, nice, fun part, picture-wise. Ah, that one. Uh, without the sun, there is nothing as far as um, life or even gravity to keep everything together. Uh, that's a real picture from 2012. And can we get get second life on Mars? Um, okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, it is. And that is a solar prominence. Now, you don't want to be, in other words, if you're going to be looking at that, it's good to look at it in that direction and not be 
in the direction. Uh, yeah, lag would be incredible. Um, 15 minutes, something like that. Okay, so you don't want to be on the receiving end of that uh, coronal uh, prominence there, mass uh, ejection of particles going at 2 million uh, miles an hour out into space, uh, because that would be very bad for the Earth and uh, communications and the whole bit. Um, let's take a look a little bit at the sun. Is essentially, if we were to say the sun itself is kind of, uh, eh, okay, kind of a star right in the middle. Um, it's about middle-aged. Um, it's not terribly big. It's not terribly small. It is 90% brighter than most other stars, if you look at all the stars, because a lot of stars are a lot redder, a lot smaller. So it's a fair, fairly decent uh, star. Um, in, in what's called the main sequence, meaning it's been pretty much like it has for about 4.6 billion years. But unfortunately for you guys out there, the reason why we need to find planet B is um, it's getting hotter. It was about 30% dimmer when the Earth formed. And in 600 million years, and now it's been 600 million years since multicellular life form, Cambrian, here. And unfortunately, in 600 million years, the sun will be hot enough that it will actually disrupt the cycle of uh, formation of carbon dioxide, and it will disrupt photosynthesis, meaning life will end on Earth in 600 million years. Everybody's going, ah! Okay, but, you know, we're not going to be around. Uh, like I said, multicellular organisms uh, formed 600 million years ago. Um, at its core, if you look at it, it's essentially, yeah, if you essentially a, uh, it's not really a hydrogen bomb because it's actually a little hotter inside a hydrogen bomb, but it's 29 million degrees. It's a billion times the pressure, and that's enough to have nuclear fusion. And so about 4 million tons of the sun is converted to energy every second, and it radiates out. And so there's really a tension between gravity, which is trying to squash this thing into essentially a, 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 a white a supernova, a white dwarf. The supernova goes boom, but basically squash this thing and then make it go boom. Um, oh, OK. Um, yeah, okay, I may have gotten the, I'll have to check on the, on the, it's hot. <laughs> and it's hot enough for um, it basically to be plasma. Um, in other words, electrons are not attached to the atoms. And you got, okay. So what will happen to the sun, by the way, is that in about 5 billion years, it will become, it will have used up most of its hydrogen. And then it will get turned into a red giant. And it will then go get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it will swallow up Mercury and Venus and almost out to Earth. By then, of course, you know, there's no life in 600 million years on Earth. Anyway, the seas will boil. Earth will be a very uh, not so great place to, uh, yeah. And when we talk about degrees, we're really talking temperature has to do with how particles are moving around. And so the corona uh, is not nearly as, it's, it's very tenuous, uh, meaning it's not very dense, but the particles are really moving around. Okay. So let's take a look also then at the sun, is that some of our first spacecraft, like Pioneer and others, uh, went up there to look at the sun because the sun is so important to what's going on here at Earth. And... One thing that happens, of course, that we can see ever since uh, Galileo times is that we've got sunspots. Well, the reason we have sunspots is because the interior of the sun rotates four times as fast as the exterior. Yep, uh, Parker Solar Probe is coming up this moment, and uh, it actually disrupts the magnetic field. The north-south poles reverse every 22 years. In other words, instead of there being an 11-year cycle, it's really a 22-year cycle. And uh, 
that creates uh, these these loops uh, in the magnetic field, which then create particles that go out there, and sometimes it it, it ejects particles. It's really a mess. You wouldn't want to be too uh, near the uh, the sun. Um, and here's some other spacecraft that have been out there. Um, here's some newer spacecraft or, or more recent spacecraft that have been out there looking at the sun because it does. If you had one of those coronal ejections come out this way, we would want to know before it got here. And so we would have a little bit of time to uh, warn everybody because essentially it can do a real number on satellites and communications and everything else. Um, the Parker solar probe, as somebody mentioned, will actually be flying through the corona at the end of its uh, mission. Right now it's currently out there. Um, and then we also had um, Genesis uh, return a solar wind sample. Solar wind is what's coming out from. It's the particles that are coming out from the sun. We'll learn more about here that in a minute when we take a look at the Earth. Okay, Mercury. This is a false color picture of Mercury, basically showing the topographic uh, features. Um, false shape, too. Oh, yeah, I guess it's kind of egg-shaped in here. I should, um, what should I do? Let's see. I'll bet you if I... <laughs> um, let me see. If I do this... No, it's worse. Hang on a second. Is that better a little bit? Okay, yeah. <laughs> we don't we don't want it looking like an egg. Um that's that's still kind of eggy looking, but uh, it's better than it was. Okay, so Mercury. Uh thanks for letting me know. Okay, so Mercury, I thought I was just looking at a weird angle. Okay, so Mercury there, that's that's what it looks like with at least some false color in there. Topographical features. Um, we've only had two. Well, <laughs> yeah, except Mercury couldn't do that because it's pretty solid. Um, it's actually it it and it's very dense, but it's not the densest planet in the. It is, uh, and we'll take a look at that when I get to asteroids. We'll take a look at the reason why it is. Um, but actually, the Earth is the densest planet, which is, is very interesting uh, why it is. Um, but we've only had two probes go to Mercury because it's really hard to get there. You have to carry a lot of fuel uh, to get there. Now, Mercury is only about a third the size of the Earth and about a third of the distance. And it does have an egg-shaped orbit <laughs> or a very um, uh, elliptical-type orbit, which varies from 47 to 70 million uh, kilometers from the sun, but it's locked into gravitational with the sun. So essentially it has, even though it has a 59 Earth day rotation, it takes two years for there to be a day night cycle on Mercury itself if you're standing on the surface. Of course, if you're standing on the surface, you'd incinerate anyway. But I'm talking about, you know, theoretically. Okay, so, but one of the interesting things we found about um, Mercury is it has water ice. In fact, we're finding that there's water ice everywhere. Uh, that's one of the big things. Yeah, I know. Um, it, in the areas which kind of never get heated, it's got water ice. Um, and we're finding that, that there's, in fact, one of the latest things, and I think last October, November, is that we're finding that there's water ice everywhere on the moon, on, on our own moon, Earth's moon, because not just um, um, at the poles where it was first discovered. Okay, that and then you can also and so you can see it now. There's only been one craft to orbit Mercury. Uh, yeah, they're gone and and hang hang loose. Uh, we're gonna get there. We just got to go further out in the solar system. Okay, there is Venus. Um, and uh, Venus here again, topographically. But Venus is a lot more interesting than Mercury anyway. Mercury's got lots of craters 
and stuff, and it kind of looks, you know, like the moon. It's craters. Okay, yeah, isn't that cool? I like that. But Venus has volcanoes and lava and stuff like that. And we've even, uh, there's a new uh, uh, a probe that's been funded to go down to the surface of Venus. Venus pretty much is a, the only people that have been down to the, the surface are um, uh, Soviet Union. And they had 16 missions, 10 of which um, got to the surface. Now, bear in mind, it's really hard to do this back in the early days. I mean, the first mission to the moon missed the moon by three moon rings. <laughs> Same thing, the first one here on Venus missed it by quite a bit, but they got better and better uh, at getting them. Um, well, there's a thought about terraforming, and it's, but the first thing you're going to have to get over is that there's a lot of pressure. Uh, that, that uh, in fact, actually, that's kind of what Venus looks like. Not, now, Venus is almost the size of the Earth. I think it's about 85% the size of the Earth. What it really looks like is one of the pictures is up for the upper right, which, believe it or not, looks a lot like on the planet Titan, except it's, this is 850 degrees Fahrenheit. And whether that's Fahrenheit or centigrade, that's above the melting point of lead. So you're talking about really, really hot. Uh, 90 atmosphere, sulfuric acid, carbon dioxide, 225 mile an hour winds, very hostile to anything and everything. And so uh, you're going to have to do a lot of work to terraform uh, Venus. Now, on the other hand, Venus has been thought that it at one time was not too dissimilar from Earth, but essentially it had a runaway greenhouse effect. And that's what caused what's happening today. Or at least, you know, it's been like this for billions of years. Uh, there's a picture of what, uh, from a radar standpoint, what it might look like there. And there's been some of the more recent uh, trips to well, it could be. It's a little close. Um, the sun would be rather impressive. You'd have to wear, uh, what, UV 1000 or something, right? <laughs> um, so, in any case, uh, you've got some... Yeah, let's, let's work on Earth so it isn't a future Venus. I think that idea. Let's work on preserving our own planet. We don't have a planet B yet. Uh, yeah, I, I thought Max might have an opinion on that one. Uh, yeah, it's no wonder. Yeah, okay. So, in any case, uh, the Venus uh, Express Orbiter was up there for quite some time looking at things. There's been lots of flybys, and then the uh, orbiter from uh, Japan, which is there now. In fact, it's the only ship that's there currently working uh, on uh, Venus, orbiting Venus. Okay, good old Earth here, planet A. <laughs> now, if we look at Earth, what are some, before I do the next slide, what are some of the things that make Earth unique? I mean, okay, here you're an alien, you're looking at this thing, what do you... What do you think? I've been there, <laughs> yeah. In fact, you are here. Okay, so what are some unique things if somebody looked at this either remotely or we're close enough to see it like this. Uh, what are some uh, things about Earth that are different from the other planets? Green? Yeah, for the most part, some of it's green. It, it, it's um, actually kind of blue and got lots of <laughs> clouds and stuff. It's got oxygen. In other words, 70%, 71%, I think, is water um, but there are a lot of green parts there's water uh, this is the only one that we know of that actually has liquid water everywhere okay uh, most of the other ones have in fact actually most of the plants have water but it's very cold out in space and it's not liquid um, on the surface it's under ice or encapsulated in the rocks itself in fact that's what they i'll skip ahead real quick in thought to Mars is they think now that Mars did have oceans, but essentially the water didn't go anywhere. It's in the rocks. Okay.
Absolutely. There you go. Okay, that's a good way of putting it. Surface is infested with self-replicating chemistry. Absolutely. Okay. So let's take a look at some of the things that make uh, Earth unique. Is one, it's a water planet. Okay. Continental drift is that uh, continental drift has been going on for uh, quite some time, a couple billion years, and uh, or at least a billion. And it's for reformed the land and made mountains and uh, erosion and lots of things that have helped uh, to create the world that we are in now. Uh, up on the upper right, you'll actually see when we talk about oxygen, at one time there wasn't oxygen. And it wasn't until oxygen, uh, until organisms created oxygen as a byproduct. Uh, that you had oxygen and then you had uh, these iron belts and lots of stuff uh, go on. But oxygen levels have been, uh, hence the carbon explosion. Yep. And then um, oxygen levels have been a lot higher. They've been a lot lower. Uh, and that's the red line is where they are now. Same thing with carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has been a lot higher than it is right now. But then you wouldn't want to live at the time when there was a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, yes, you're correct, uh, proposed by Wegener in 1912, and a lot of people kind of laughed at him or, or, and then until they go, oh, later in the 50s, 60s, 70s, going, ooh, uh, maybe he's right. Okay, but carbon dioxide right now is as high as it's been in the last 30 or 40 million years. Yeah, high oxygen, great insects, or giant insects, all that good stuff like that. So... Um, so oxygen, it's a densest planet. It's got now one of the things, by the way, is it's got a moon stabilized inclination. This is really important to life. We're only inclined by 23 and a half degrees right now, and it's only and the reason why is is the moon. And the moon has helped us to do this. Some of the other planets have, have flipped over and, and done um, uh, all kinds of inclinations during their history, and that would play real havoc on uh, life. Okay, some of the earlier space shots basically went up and looked at our um, magnetic field. Uh, actually, if you look at it, uh, it, it's called the Van Allen radiation belt, and essentially what you've got, yep, uh, the fingernail growing speed is uh, actually continental the continents drift at a speed of the rate of your fingernail, depending on where you are. Some are faster, some are slower. Um, thank you. Okay. But Van Allen, Van, Allen, Van Allen radiation belt. By the way, if any, any astrophysicists outside, which of these, if you look at the area, there's an there's a orange area and a, and a green and then a blue area. And of course, they're not those colors. But what is positive? and one is negative. And then the auroras are formed at the poles there as the uh, electromagnetic field inter interacts with the atmosphere and charges it and then forms um, ions in the atmosphere. It's also the only known planet, as somebody mentioned, that it's infested with life and the biosphere interacts with the planet. Oh, thank you. I hope so. That's the, that's how you can uh, uh, pay attention. I mean, that's how you can keep interested without my droning on. <laughs> okay, but one of the things about Earth that's, that's kind of weird is that um, there's a lot of little objects around it. We may not have we may not have a lot of moons, uh, but we definitely have a lot of little objects floating around. In fact, there's 29,000 objects larger than your hand, 670,000 objects larger than a centimeter, and gazillions of objects that are smaller. And a lot of these are satellites. So most of them don't work. And yeah, a lot of little moonlets. And so actually, you know, the International Space Station, which is the next slide here. Whoop, no, it's not. Hang on a second. This one, and then I'll come back to that. The International Space Station, which is the only one up there right now, China had one earlier, and there has been uh, one uh, Russia, like with the Soviet stuff, is, uh, and they think they can go to about 2030 
with the International Space Station. But it actually has to move. Yeah, international, absolutely. It has to, and other astronauts have been up there uh, from other countries. And so the International Space Station has to actually move two or three times a year to avoid some of those little particles, by the way. Now, looking at the particles is uh, one of the things is the reason we found this little thing. Um, if it's pronounced anyone, uh, I went to the University of Hawaii. Hawaii is an e Hawaiian is an easy language to pronounce. So you basically pronounce it uh, by letter. So it's Oumuamua. Um, yeah, Oumuamua. Um, meaning um, not visitor, it's, it, there's another name for it. Okay, but in any case, it's the first known visitor from another solar system. Ah, okay, um, that we know of. Obviously, there's been, and the reason why they found it uh, was because we want to know where all, scout, excellent, that's, yeah, that's what it means. Um, okay, so we want to know not only our own satellites, but we want to know anything else that may uh, get to Earth or near Earth. And I'll show you that. It's kind of actually scary how many objects um, come near Earth or have the potential to come near Earth. The moon. Well, when we say the moon, that's kind of Earth-centric. Um, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, Barragon, and I'll get to that here in a minute, but it's thought to be actually a piece of nitrogen ice from a planet similar to Pluto that got um, probably in a collision or something from another uh, solar system. Or already have hit the Earth, absolutely. And continental drift has erased a lot of them, except for the bigger or more recent craters. Okay, space is large. Well, you're right, and that's good. Okay, Earth-centric, when we say the moon, because actually there are over 200 moons in the solar system that we know of. Uh, I'm going to briefly show the ones in circles really quick. Um, but we've got, and I also put the size of Mercury and Pluto there, since they're not considered moons. Um, and also Cirrus, if that's how it's pronounced there, in the top is considered a dwarf planet now. Um, and it's the largest object in the asteroid belt. Okay, let's... Um, Take a look at that. So when we say moon, you have to say, well, what moon? Okay, great. Well, the Earth's moon. No, actually it does. It looks blue because of the, the, the water and stuff. Um, well, let's take a look because actually some of them do look different colors and such. So that's, that's a very good uh, question there, Shiloh. So let's take a look at what uh, we have out there because I'm going to show you... So let's take a look. Okay, Earth's moon, let's first take a look at it. Is Earth's moon was thought to be um, Earth, it's only about a quarter of the size of the Earth. And yeah, the Earth really is blue. Those are, um, uh, yeah, I, I think so too, except for on the back of it. <laughs> In other words, if you're looking at the night side. Okay, so in any case, Earth is, the moon is thought to be. Um, from a collision of an object about the size of Mars way, 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 way back in the early days of the solar system. And there's, yeah, uh, Thea. Okay, and if you look at the bottom right, uh, this is based on actually looking at moon rock analysis back in around 2016. And they're going, wow, there's some um, isotopic, um, there's some evidence here about the uh, core of the Earth, uh, the moon, and about why the Earth is the densest, and about the core material from Theia sinking into the Earth's core, and the moon uh, having uh, similar uh, isotopic uh, consistency stuff, and all kinds of cool things. And basically, they think, if you look at the Lagrangian points, L5, L4, of the Earth, is, there, is that there's a thought that there used to be a, another little Mars-sized planet there, um, which, by the way, with the uh, definition of planets, makes would have made the Earth not a planet, but a dwarf planet <laughs> like uh, Pluto, but whatever. Long ago, it 
spiraled in and hit the moon and or hit the earth and some people say it hit uh, kind of obliquely some people said hit head on and in any case it formed the moon it they also formed another little body which is not out there and either hit the back of the moon uh, and went together or they've recently found that there's something following mars which suspiciously has the same sort of composition as our own moon and so they're thinking that's possible that was something that was discovered last year okay so let me continue on uh what will happen to the tides well the interesting thing chris is that moon is actually re retreating at about a centimeter, is it a centimeter uh, per year from the Earth? It's got, we know that because there are laser stations set up on the moon. And you can see that. And so, uh, oh, okay. It's okay, you're right, is where the gravity of the moon and the Earth balance out. Um, that's, yes, that's correct. The other thing, the other interesting thing is that when you have two objects together, they don't just gravitationally, they don't just decide, okay, I'm going to be the one that everything orbits. <laughs> it depends on their mass. So actually, the moon is big enough that the, the center of gravity between them is just inside the crust of the Earth. So the Earth actually wobbles a little bit as the moon goes around it. It's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, wow, lots of, lots of cool comments here. Okay wobble effect okay but you may not know that there's been a lot of missions to the moon in other words it's not just the u.s uh uh or even the soviets or whatever but it, but everything even even luxembourg believe it or not uh had a a, a role in uh helping uh missions to uh the moon and um uh, but the last people on the moon were back in 1972, although that's going to be changing in this decade if everything goes right, okay? Um, let's take a look. Seven missions have been in the last five years. Um, not, actually the moon didn't, obviously uh, it's, there's tides, like I said, um, it helps the moon, the Earth, from in, its its inclination from deviating too far from 23 and a half degrees, that sort of thing. There's also 33 missions planned to the moon. Here's some of the more recent ones. As we know, China landed a lander on the far side of the moon. That's the first thing done, and it had a little rover, and it took a picture, as you can see right there. You can see its tracks. Took a little picture. Uh, India. Uh, also sent one, an orbiter and lander. The little lander, unfortunately, crashed, but then a lot of landers have uh, crashed on the moon, and, you know, uh, you, yeah, you basically walk before you run sort of thing, so it's not surprising. Uh, same thing with uh, Israel. Uh, there's also a craft called TESS, which goes out by the moon and then swings back by Earth. Um, well, yes. Yeah, that's due to, yeah, it's due to uh, Earth and not uh, the moon in this case. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the other moons. I'm, I'm running a tiny bit long today because uh, there's a lot of comments and, and, and these are kind of interesting. So I'm going to not speed through it, but I'm going to kind of make sure that I'm not too far over an hour. Okay, so Jupiter's largest moons. If you look at this, if you look at the, the, the moon compared to Ganymede, Jupiter's largest moons are actually bigger than our moon. And Ganymede and Europa are thought to have the Galilean moons, absolutely. The ones which Galileo saw, the four biggest ones. And so, uh, human romance, yes. Okay, so um, saltwater oceans are thought to be on Europa and Ganymede. And of course, Europa, we actually have something called the Europa Clipper, which is supposed to go out to uh, Europa and check it out. Um, Jupiter also protects the Earth. Uh, I'll show you that here in just a second. Io, of course, is the first one that we actually saw active volcanoes on, sulfur volcanoes. And we've actually, 
and there's geysers on Europa who have actually had a spacecraft go through them. Well, the oceans are not only alkaline, um, but they, you're, you're correct. In other words, the little, they're, uh, yeah, that's uh, 2010 uh, um, uh, is what you're, the, which movie you're talking about. Okay, and then Callisto is the size of a Mercury. Okay, Titan is the largest moon, very interesting. Is a, it's the only one with a dense atmosphere, and we've landed on it. And if you actually watch the videos, it's it's superb. Um, well, there are actually four books in that series from two thousand one Space Odyssey, two thousand ten, two thousand sixty one, three thousand is the, the the four books involved. Okay, so in any case, we've actually landed. There was a little uh, uh, spacecraft that, uh, yep. Yeah, uh, and there's a little spacecraft that went down to um, and landed on Titan and with, with a parachute. And what did they find? They found rocks made of ice, mountains made of ice, running methane rivers and lakes. And there's even been some uh, thought about putting a little, yeah, a little submarine there to, to check out their, the lakes. But it's the only one that we know of that has running it's not water because it's too cold but it basically it has rivers and lakes and mountains and it, it, very exciting uh it's all methane yep uh but there's no oxygen so it's not like going to go or anything and it's very cold so you got to have heat you know fire is, is fire triangle means you got to have heat uh and oxygen and a fuel source yeah uh yeah scopes the surface it looks a lot like earth uh, at, or Mars. Okay, here's some not so exciting moons, although they're kind of cool because in some cases they've kind of been whacked hard and put back together. Uh, these are little smaller ones, but Saturn has, those are Saturn's moons. Uh, well, there's no oxygen, so it's not going to do anything. Plus, it's way, way too cold to support a fire like that. Um, like Zippo. <laughs> Titan, uh, Triton, excuse me, um, is actually quite large. The, our moon is in back to show you the size of some of these ones. And Triton is big enough that uh, they, it actually rotates in the opposite direction that Neptune does. So they think about it. Well, these are all gods and goddesses associated with um, the planet names. Okay, they think that Triton may have been captured from, thank you, um, captured from the Kuiper Belt. Okay, Mars. We haven't even gotten to Mars yet, but we are. Oh, well, we haven't gotten to Mars, but uh, spacecraft have. Now, in the early days, uh, what you have here is a map from 1962 Mars. And even then, we thought there were canals or something on Mars. Well, it wasn't until Mariner went by Mars and everybody got really disappointed because they go, it looks like the moon. It's just craters. Where are the Martians? There's no canals. Yeah, I know. It was really disappointing. Uh, of course, we know that Mars is exciting. And by the way, the, the idea of it having canal is a misinterpretation of an Italian. It's canali, meaning channels, not canals, as in um, snarkiness. <laughs> it's, uh, it means channels, not like you know man-made uh, canals. Okay, so here are some spacecraft. There's 49 missions to Mars. About half of them haven't made it. <laughs> Eight are operational right now. There's seven planned for the next five years. Here's some of the ones that are re recently. Somebody mentioned United Arab Emirates. They have a little orbiter. Uh, by the way, it was a, uh, a woman who headed the uh, mission, uh, just as a trivial thing, in the United Arab Emirates. China has an orbiter and a rover. In other words, stay tuned. Uh, the rover is supposed to go down to Mars in June. Uh, InSight is one of the more recent ones, and the it's exploring Mars interior, although it's having problems right now with uh, charging up. It's got a lot of dust on it. Um,
it's got a lot of dust on it and they're afraid uh, you know it's got to charge up to keep going and then perseverance has both a rover and a helicopter on it which is supposed to take off possibly next week they just have to check it out it did do a spin test yesterday okay and here's perseverance what perseverance is looking is going to do is perseverance is looking for signs of life uh on mars and so uh what you what it actually did was it landed kind of a safe place in this big jezero crater and it's going to go over to that delta which they know is a river delta or at least it looks everything like a river delta and the little helicopter is going to help it go off and uh it's got 23 cameras on it and all kinds of cool stuff and we're looking forward to, to it um the Martian, yes. So we're looking forward to the flight plan. Yeah, it was originally earlier, but they need to, they're doing some work on the uh, flight software. Uh, they know the thing actually, you know, spins. Uh, it's just that they don't want it to go up and then crash. That would be bad. So they, you know, they're working on that. Okay, so we know Mars is not a uh, uninteresting world. It's got um, the biggest volcano, a sense, um, much bigger than Mount Everest. It's got the biggest um, Persevere, which, by the way, was the name was presented by, I think, a sixth or eighth grade student. They had a contest, and that was the name that they chose. Yeah. And so uh, it's got one of the biggest, it's got the biggest uh, canyon that we know. Uh, it, and it had seas uh, very long ago. They think that the, uh, they found some um, uh, lakes with water ice near the poles, but um, they uh, think that the water, like I said earlier, has not disappeared. It simply has gone into the rocks, which means that there's probably water uh, that you can get. Now, if you have water, you can get oxygen and hydrogen and all kinds of good stuff like that. Okay, let's take a look at asteroids and comets. I am going to go over a little bit. I'm going to try to keep it within the next 15 minutes here because we're now out of the asteroid, but I don't want to go too fast. Um, okay, the seven planets were formed some time ago when a supernova exploded and kind of got things to mush together. And if you look at the bottom right, that's actually a planetary disk from uh, the Taurus uh, constellation that um, you can actually see. So we're not, it's not just a conjecture, we've actually seen. Okay, I won't speed up too fast. Excuse <laughs> me, because this is interesting stuff. Okay, but you can actually see there's, there's what's called a soot line, which the planets inside there, like Mercury, this is another star that we see this. But basically, the planets inside a soot line, the only thing that they're going to be able to have on them is metals, like mercury. Okay? If it's formed beyond the soot line, then you have carbon, like methane and carbon dioxide and stuff. The frost line is where everything's going to be frozen. But in, in the kind of Goldilocks thing between the soot line and the frost line, you could find an Earth. In other words, like liquid water and, and such like that. Mars is just a little bit too far out for the water to be liquid. But like I said at one time, it probably had oceans. But it's very fascinating. Jupiter and Saturn, and this is kind of an odd thing. Jupiter and Saturn, they haven't just stayed where they are. What they've done is they formed further out. They kind of migrated toward the sun. Jupiter kind of got to where Mars is right now and kind of took up a lot of the material there otherwise mars would be much bigger that's why mars is so small um <laughs> well it, it would have to move much faster close to speed of light for time to speed up okay and then jupiter and saturn then became gravitationally bound started moving outward uh the asteroid belt formed instead of a planet it formed because jupiter basically prevented it from coalescing and became Planet. There could also be ejected planets. That's right. Um, uh, yeah, Mars. Uh, actually, the sun was not as hot. It's just that the Mars did have oceans, and then it got 
colder because it couldn't keep the heat in. Okay, you know, like uh, a, ra uh, a radioactivity um, in the center. Okay, the asteroid belt, like I said, formed because Jupiter didn't allow a planet to form there, and then Mars was deprived of building materials. And then the comets were formed further out. Yeah, exactly, the interactions with Jupiter. There's also something called the uh, late heavy bombardment, which explains a lot about uh, meteors hitting the moon and Earth and all that stuff. But lately, it's been somewhat of a discredited theory. OK, asteroids and comets. Here's the scary part. We know of 20,000 near-Earth asteroids and 100 comets, which could hit the Earth. Ah! OK. Uh, yeah, long, long time ago. Long before we have to worry about life or anything else, even if life formed 2 billion years ago. This is long time ago. OK. The, uh, as I mentioned, that Oumuamua one, uh, we found that. It was partly everything, yeah, long, long time ago. But basically, uh, it's out of the plane of the solar system. Most of, most of these, it's kind of a flat disk. And it rotates around or revolves around the sun. But this thing, one of the reasons we knew it was, yeah, it came from another solar system. And it kind of came in at an angle that we go, wow, this isn't formed around here. And like I said, it's kind of, a, we, we now are pretty sure it's nitrogen ice sliced from a planet like Pluto. OK, when we say asteroids, here again, when I was in school long ago, well, actually, I've <laughs> been in school most of my life, but I think. But uh, when I was in secondary school or before, they were talking about, you know, the asteroids are between Mars and Earth. Well, that's not entirely true. The main asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter. But there are other asteroids. There are what are called the Trojans and the Greeks. There's actually a spacecraft going to go out and check, some, check these out uh, around on the Lagrangian points between, oh, yeah, that, yes, absolutely, uh, litter from broken up planets and also planets that didn't form. Um, the Trojans are in the Lagrangian points of Jupiter, and there's a lot of them. And there's also ones called the Hildas. And they even think that Earth may have a little something following it that is a bunch of particles that haven't quite uh, come together. Yes, the Lagrangian points of Jupiter is over around the sun. Uh, yeah, they, they do. They, they travel in the same orbit as Jupiter. It's just that they kind of got stuck there from a gravitational standpoint. Okay, so the asteroids are not very big. Um, the biggest one, thank you. Uh, I hope it's not too long. And here again, I'm, I'm, I don't want to rush, but uh, I, I will keep it in a, within a decent amount of time. Is Sirius is a uh, Cirrus is the largest. It actually takes up a quarter of the mass of the asteroid belt, and it has a briny ocean under its surface. We know that because the Dawn spacecraft, uh, which um, actually, there, absolutely. Yeah, there's lots of, yeah, Japan's actually been pretty busy with um, uh, spacecraft. I, I mentioned one around the moon, moon also, is that, uh, or Mars, I think, or moon. Uh, but Dawn spacecraft actually, it's the first spacecraft to actually orbit to bodies, and Cirrus and Vesta are the two biggest ones in the asteroid belt. And it went and, and looked at Cirrus, and it found uh, a briny ocean under the surface. And uh, remember that the object that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs was about 10 times as small as some of these objects. So these are pretty good sized objects. Also, uh, the in fact, the one from Japan, if you'll remember, it sent back samples and the little spacecraft landed in Australia. They picked it up, and it's got samples of, Sir of, of, a, of one of the asteroids, not Cirrus, but one of them. Yeah, and they're, and they're looking at it. That'll be the first time ever that we've seen stuff like that. And then there's another uh, mission that is also going to recover a sample, and it, but it's still going until 2023. Okay, so most exciting. How about comets? Well, 
we've actually looked at comets for some time, but if you'll remember, there was an exciting mission that went to the Rosetta one, uh, went to this big peanut or duck-shaped comet, and um, actually landed, although it actually bounced because it would only have weighed as much as a piece of paper, basically, and it landed, and it was supposed to put these spikes into the comet, and it uh, didn't, the, the, the spikes didn't work, so it kind of bounced and then went under a, a big cliff, and, uh, but we found it, in other words, it, it, uh, a, a while later, it didn't signal again, pretty cool, actually, that sort of stuff. Okay, Jupiter, let's take a look at Jupiter. Jupiter is outstanding, it's the biggest planet, of course. Um, about 10 times the diameter of the Earth. And there's been lots of stuff go to Jupiter. There's about 10 that have gone to the outer planets, only three beyond Saturn, though. But we've had some outstanding missions. In fact, Juno's there now in orbit since 2016. Uh, Galileo, uh, um, was the first to orbit, and then we had ones go by even uh, earlier than that, and they've had, particularly Juno and other ones have had some outstanding, what makes the colors? Very good question, and it's organic molecules, and also uh, interactions with, uh, yeah, Beecher. Um Yeah, it's cool. Ah, and there, there's some, you, if you look up the, if you actually go up over to the NASA or JPL side, and you look at, you can see all the pictures. There's some really cool, uh, but yeah, the red spot, for example, is, is a 400 mile an hour hurricane that's larger than the Earth, it's existed for centuries. You can actually see the moon and its shadow there. Um, uh, organic meaning carbon, but Jupiter has a lot of carbon based. Now, I, might, I may even do a little presentation on some of the stuff we found out there as far as organic, but organic means carbon. That doesn't mean life, but it means, it can mean that, uh, yeah. Okay. So Jupiter rotates only about at 10 hours. I mean, the Earth rotates in 24 hours. So if this rotates really, really fast, well, it, it probably wouldn't be life. In other words, if we're going to find life, we're going to find it on Europa or someplace. Um, in other words, where there's actual uh, saline seas that are liquid. Okay, or Ganymede, or one of those. Okay, so De Jupiter rotates in about 10 hours, which produces 900 mile an hour. Here again, sorry, it's not in metric, uh, but it's fast, near the poles. And then there's organic materials that create the colors. And by the way, they've recently conjectured is that as this material descends into Jupiter, in other words, falls, there's no surface of Jupiter, so it just continues falling. There's a core, but it just gets higher and higher pressure, and it's enough to create diamonds. So think of this, is, is a rain of diamonds into the core of Jupiter uh, from the organic material at the um, outer part. It's kind of a very interesting idea. Okay, it's got the strongest magnetic field, and it also has lightning. We see uh, one of the first spacecraft saw lightning on the opposite side. Okay, Saturn. You can also see auroras. Up there, just like the auroras on Earth there. Um, yeah, actually, I like that symphony, uh, the one where the planets. I used to use that for planetarium presentations. Yeah, Saturn is gorgeous. Everybody's always thought it was. And we found that uh, the Cassini mission in particular uh, found that the rings were very, very complicated. And they were wondering whether they're old or young. Well, they're quite young. And they also think that it, perhaps in only 100,000 years, the rings might go away. Everybody go, ah, ah, okay. But there's other rings, and they'll probably have some more rings going on. There's also um, a very weird storm group of storm systems. Yep, every, uh, lots of things actually have rings, a little bit. Um, okay. Let's take a look at Saturn. If you see a tiny little Earth up there by the, the name Saturn, that's approximately the, the right um, size. Um, yep. And as far as rings, 
And you'll see that uh, what Saturn, Saturn is actually light. It could actually float if you had a big enough ocean to float it on. It's compared to, you know, the rocky little planets. Rings are very popular in space, yep. So in other words, if you see, uh, the rings are too, there's not enough mass to, um, for mass to even, for Saturn to even notice. It's like, you know, tiny little gnats going around. Um, but that's good thoughts. I, I love the comments. Okay, Uranus. By the way, only school kids pronounce this Uranus. Uh, it can be pronounced both ways, but basically space scientists pronounce it Uranus. Um, whatever. <laughs> okay, so Voyager 2 is the only spacecraft that's gone out that way. Yes, the sun does shine, but the sun would be not much more than a star out about here. In other words, a bright star. Uh, by the way, yeah, en Enceladus is a very fascinating moon. I, I may have had it earlier, but it's pretty far out. Um, now, one of the distinctive things is this, speaking of inclination or tilt, is Uranus is almost up and down. In other words, if we look at it, we're going to be seeing the poles. Uh, so it t actually takes 42 years as it goes around the, the sun for there to be a day and night on Uranus. And you can see the size of the Earth as compared to... Now, the pictures from here are not as quite... It is an amazing view. And this is kind of... And, and you can see lightning and stuff. And this is slightly false colored to magnify the look to it. In other words, some of these look a little bit more like that. <laughs> That's Neptune. Uh, Voyager here again is the only one that goes there. But you can see is the core is probably a little rocky core, and then mostly water, ammonia, methane, uh, hydrogen, helium, uh, very, very, very cold out in, in there. Um, uh, what I said earlier on this one was essentially that instead of like the Earth pretty much rotating on the plane of the solar system is essentially it rotates almost opposite of that. So it's, it's you see the rings, we would see the rings like this rather than otherwise. So we don't know a whole lot about these because there's only one spacecraft that's gone by it a while ago and it went by it really fast, like, you know, 75,000 miles an hour. And so we, if we want to know more about these, we're going to have to go out there. Well, now this one here, and, and you'll notice with the time is that we're not far from the edge of the solar system and I'm not far from the edge of my presentation. So yeah, exactly. So if you'll bear with me here, a few more minutes, is Pluto was a real surprise. The New Horizons spacecraft went out there. We expected to see, well, we don't know. You know, it's kind of small and not much, in fact, it's smaller than some of the moons. And when we went out there, we go, oh, my goodness, this is outstanding. For one, what do you don't see? You don't see a lot of craters. Uh, discover we did it. Mm, okay. Uh, or maybe by Mickey Mouse. Blue dog. Okay. So it's you don't see a lot of craters out there, meaning that the surface actually uh, is rejuvenated. This is a dynamic planet. How could it possibly be there? Um, as far out as it is. I mean, we're only talking about the surface being not that, I, I don't know how many degrees Kelvin, but really, really um, far out. And so uh, we think that what's happening is it's got a solid core, like some of the other rocky type ones, but it's got liquid water, perhaps ice water, liquid water with nitrogen ice cells, which are active. If you look at some of those cells there on the bottom right, this could very well be the Arctic with the uh, pingos and stuff. Solid, yep, yeah, solid nitrogen on the surface. Ice water mountains, like on the moon Titan uh, around Saturn. This is, a, uh, yeah, very cold. But this is exciting. This is uh, incredible. Uh, fine. Uh, people were terribly excited about the, uh, about, um, uh, yeah, no land shifting, but 
In other words, you're not going to have magnetic fields, and et cetera, et cetera, or kind of drift and all that. But what you do have is a dynamic surface, much like on some of the moons that are around uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Very cool. Okay, now, if we go beyond Pluto, we have, and I'm almost done. Uh, if we go beyond Pluto, if you look at it, and you see where the, over on the far, on the bottom left, you have the sun, the asteroid belt. Now, if you kind of push that there into the center of the other one, Pluto has a very odd orbit in red, and there's a whole bunch of stuff out there in what's called the Kuiper belt. And one of them, the New Horizons spacecraft, actually went by that Ultima Thule one there. Uh, yes, uh, Pluto has five moons. We didn't know that until the spacecraft went out there. But it, it has five moons, one of them named Sharon. Um, okay, so we act it actually saw that little thing. That's actually two little kind of mushy uh, ice thingies that have been smushed together very gently uh, and traveled together. Um, yeah, and so uh, that's by far the farthest object that we've seen. Okay, so now, well, how far out have we actually seen? Is that if you look at it, the sun, if you look at the entire thing as a blue line, the sun itself is moving through the solar system, but it's got the solar wind going out that are a million miles an hour, and it slows down until it gets to what's called the termination shock, just like a shock wave, like a sound wave. And then there's the heliopause, and now you're out in outer space. And the reason the Voyager 2 actually knew this is if you look at the graph, you'll see that it could sense that it was out beyond the solar system, that you would um, uh, have more cosmic rays and less of the radiation coming from the sun. And so it actually has escaped the solar system, which is most cool. That was, there are also other spacecraft. We've got New Horizons now that is out at 50 AU, in other words, 50 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. You've got the Pioneers, you've got Voyagers all going on in different uh, directions. Uh, yes, it, it actually is very fascinating, and I'm almost done. Um, yes, the you're, you're correct, the Oort cloud is a good, actually a good distance to the next star. Speaking of which, um, how do we know that other places have planets? Well, this is actually, if I were showing you this is a PowerPoint slide, this is a video that you can actually see. And as the moon, Sharon, goes around Pluto, the center of gravity is actually outside of Pluto. So when you look at it, Pluto actually wobbles, just like the, the actually the sun does too. The center of gravity for Jupiter and the sun is, is uh, just outside the surface of the sun. And so you can actually see by the wobble or the dimming of the star that they have other planets. Well, how many have we found? As of the end of January, there's 4,341 planets which we found near the solar system. Isn't that outstanding? Uh, the nearest Earth-like one is, guess where? The nearest Earth one is, like planet that we found is, fortunately, the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. Um, yeah, cloud actually, dust cloud, and when you're talking about that, you may only be talking about a handful of atoms in a you know, cubic centimeter or something, but in other words, it's not exactly, uh, there's a Milky Way. Milky Way is a, and, and I think this is the next slide, last slide, is um, the Milky Way is a barred spiral. We didn't know it was barred. Uh, and there's the closest stars, and, what the, and Alpha Centauri is actually a three-star system. It's the nearest star at about 4.1 light years away. And what they're actually thinking of doing, serious, the people that have money, uh, there's a billionaire funding this thing, is they're thinking of making these tiny little sails that have a chip on them. And you get a gazillion of these, and you put a laser behind them, and you can actually speed them up to 20% of the speed of light, and you can get to... Alpha Centauri in only 20 years. 
And then there's a million of them and they do sensing and maybe take a little picture and do stuff like that. So literally, if somebody funds this thing, in 20 years, we could be looking at the closest Earth-like planet, um, which, is, like I said, is around Proxima Centauri. And I think if my slides will... There, okay. And that's my... Ah! Hang on a second. There, okay. <laughs> that's my presentation for today. Thank you. It's fun putting together. I, I really like this stuff. This is, uh, as you could tell, <laughs> ever since I was a kid. It's rather amazing if you actually look up. It can be kind of scary because all you can have is between you and nothing is just some tenuous nitrogen and oxygen and other atoms up there. And that's the only thing that exists between us and that void out there. Although now, of course, we know it's not void. It's a big bunch of radiation coming out of the sun and that kind of stuff. Avoid the void. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's fun. And I love the comments. The spirited bunch today. Thank you. Sorry to go. Oh, I did want to mention for the people who are in Asia, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have less to I'm gonna have less of demands, let's say, in May and beyond. And I'm gonna try to hold some of these presentations earlier, you know, four or five hours earlier if possible. Uh, because I know for people in Asia that this is what, 2 a.m., 2.30 a.m. or something? Um, no, we'll, we'll, what we'll do is we'll have, yeah, hopefully people will be able to attend whatever, but I want to make it um, 3.30. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. I'm, I could never stay up that late. I'm a morning person. But I appreciate everybody who's able to do that. Yeah, and we need to correct that a bit. We're talking about how to do that. Ah, interesting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh. But, you know, doing this and coming to the presentations or giving one just makes my day, makes my week. Oh, good. I'm hoping it kept you awake. I'm not sure I would have been awake. It's too uh, early. <laughs> okay, for anyone that has to leave, uh, take care. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I do believe this will be online get some sleep watch the stars stars are very relaxing well except when they're exploding <laughs> hopefully they're far enough away Namaste. You too. Everybody take care. Thanks for coming. <laughs>